our weekly colloquium. Uh, our speaker today is uh, recently Dr. Uh, Rafał Ojewski, and he will tell us about few dipolar atoms. Please. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. As I am going uh, to my postdoc in Munich uh, in one month, I just want to recap some work I have done here under supervision of Professor Zanzewski and Dr. Pawłowski, just to recap in more detailed way some the most important, from my point of view, uh, topics from my PhD thesis. And without any further ado, I want to explain you the title of my presentation, but firstly, let me introduce the background uh, we have when studying cold atoms. So first of all, Ultra cold means that we really work at very low temperatures. And typically, when we study the ultra cold gas, we have temperatures lower than one micro Kelvin. And also, our system is very dilute, that we still can have a gas or a liquid in our system. And if we have such conditions in our system, it means that we enter the realm of quantum mechanics where we cannot perceive our atoms are billiard balls as in classical systems, and instead we have to deal with waves, and also we cannot say that we can distinguish between different particles that are indistinguishable, which means that we introduce quantum statistics in our system, so our particles can be bosons or fermions, or sometimes also anions. And this, all of these introduce a kind of nasty scaling of quantum problems, meaning uh, namely exponential scaling of quantum problems, our phase space scales exponentially with a number of particles instead of linear scaling of the phase space in, quantum, uh, in classical uh, mechanics. This of course makes uh, many body problems much more harder than in a classical world. However, in ultra-cold atoms, we are, our atoms are very slow because we have very ultra low temperatures. This means that in fact we are interested only in a single quantum state usually and usually it is a ground state or some few lowest excitations of our system which simplifies the analysis. Uh, from theoretical point of view amazing thing about ultra cold atoms to deal with is the fact that People in, experiment, in experiments, in modern experiments, they have achieved amazing uh, degree of controllability over the ultra-cold system. <laughs> Namely, they can control the number of particles in a system in a precise way, so they can really have two, three, one thousand, on one million particles in their system. Also, they can confine our atoms to some uh, well-seated geometry like harmonic confinements or ring geometries and so on. And what is also the most, I think, amazing about ultra-cold atoms, it is the fact that we can control in experiments the short-range interactions between our atoms from being attractive to being repulsive, from weak to strong interactions, which gives us a lot of, for theoreticians, this gives us a lot of things to play around with. Okay, but uh, in my title there is uh, something about dipolar interactions, so uh, some uh, introduction of, 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 of them. So almost all of our atoms, we know, they are like little magnets due to, non due to the non-zero value of the total spin of them. And as magnets interact, we know that we can describe their interactions as uh, dipolar interactions, which are both long-range uh, and here we see this one over r, where r is a relative distance between atoms uh, to the uh, uh, r cubed dependency over distance, and also the dipolar interactions that are anisotropic, meaning that they highly depend on the mutual configuration between two atoms and also on the direction of the magnetic moment of, of an atom. Uh, the most, uh, the most known the, the most extreme examples of how wha what anisotropic means is that we can imagine two opposite configuration in 
one, we have head-to-tail configuration when the dipolar interaction is attractive versus side-by-side -side configuration where the dipolar interaction is repulsive. Um, okay, so why dipolar interactions are interesting and why now they are interesting? First of all, as I mentioned before, almost all atoms are like little magnets. But not, of them are not all of them are strong enough to really take into account dipolar interactions in our system. However, recently it was possible to experimentally control system with, uh, with elements with a high magnetic moment, like chromium, erbium and dysprosium, where the magnetic moment of such elements is between 6 to 10 Bohr magneton, and this gives you uh, two orders of magnitude uh, stronger interactions than in the case of the rubidium atoms or the alkali atoms uh, for which the first condensations were obtained. So for such, for such elements, one cannot really neglect the dipolar interactions and also it is possible to make them even the dominant interaction in our system so we cannot neglect them anymore like in the old days. Also, for such elements, people already have predicted some, some new exotic state of matter. Uh, matter. Uh, for example, supersolidity, when we have at the same time the superfluidity in our system, and also a crystalline order, so we have both crystal and superfluid. And also the quantum droplet, which is a droplet very similar to a drop of water uh, we are all used to, but uh, in this fact, the, the stabilization mechanism is different because this is due to quantum fluctuations, and also the quantum droplet is much more dilute than a normal droplet of water, for example. Okay, but uh, in my talk, I want to study all of these phenomena, also supersolidity and quantum droplet, from the few body perspective and why this is. Uh, why this is a nice thing to do. First of all, we are interested, as we have a quite strong dipolar interactions, in the situation that we have strongly correlated systems. For that, we need more accurate uh, description than the usual mean field theory. The usual mean field theory for bosons, ultra-cold bosons, assumes that our system that the, the, the many-body wave function of our system is a product state. So we assume that all the bosons occupy a single particle orbital. And for that assumption, people were able to really predict a lot of stuff in the Bose-Einstein condensates and so on. But when we want to study stronger interactions than in the previous cases, we need a different description. That's why we have to start with relatively small systems rather than big one because of the quantum scaling of our problems. Also, we have amazing developments of optical lattices in ultra-cold gases, which means that in a single side of optical lattice, people are able right now to trap from 2 to 10, 15 atoms, something like that, and they are interested really in a few body physics or 20 body physics or something like that. So. This is also for, from experimental point of view an important thing. As I mentioned before, dipolar interactions are both anisotropic and long range. And I want to focus of, on two of these properties of dipolar interactions separately. So first of all, let me start with uh, anisotropy of dipolar interaction. So we can imagine a very simple model. We have two atoms. Uh, with some magnetic moment, and we put them into a spherical harmonic trap in three-dimensional spherical harmonic trap. And on the short range, our atoms, they repel uh, each other. They are identical particles, so this, is, this model is also, uh, this is both for bosons and fermions. And initially, when we have two-body problem in three dimension, we have, uh, this is in fact six-dimensional problem, but we can reduce it neatly using the following facts. First of all, in the harmonic trapping, we can separate the center of mass motion and the relative motion. The center of mass motion in this case is given just by the quantum harmonic oscillator, which we all, which we all are familiar with. 
And then we, we, uh, we are left with three-dimensional problem of the relative motion, but we can also observe the following fact that because we have isotropic harmonic trap, this gives us the spherical symmetry, and it means that the total angular momentum j in our system, which is a sum of the orbi relative orbital, mom uh, orbital of the relative motion, uh, orbital momentum of the relative motion, and the total spin of our atoms is conserved, which gives us, so the total angular momentum j is a good quantum number in our case. And this will reduce our, si our problem from three-dimensional to one-dimensional. But instead of a single radial Schrodinger equation to solve, we have a set of radial Schrodinger equations because we have a coupling between internal degrees of freedom given by this spins of, of total spins of our atoms and the external degree of freedom, which is our orbital momentum of the relative motion. And I want to show you the three lowest eigenstates of our system, which are for j equals zero. Because we already can see something excited, uh, exciting here. So on the first plot, we have energy as a function of effective dipolar coupling, which depends on our trapping frequency, in fact. And what we can, obtain, uh, what we can observe it is that when we increase our uh, effective dipolar coupling, we can observe anti-crossings in the energy between energy levels, and this is also uh, this is also accompanied by the change in the expectation value of the orbital of the squared orbital uh, momentum operator, and as we can see as we change our GDD, so this effective dipolar coupling, we see that for the ground state, there is a change in, in this expectation value. And also there is a change for the first excited state. So this is a repumping of the, yes? Can I have a naive question? Sorry for interrupting you, can I? Yeah. So uh, I understand that these curves are uh, results of your computations, so yeah. given model. Uh, so does the, the, what's the reason there's absolutely no scatter here, no error bars, there's no, uh, no, uh, no, uh, any inaccuracy, does it just all exact solutions? Yeah, this is an exact solution, just and numerical one. they don't depend one. on initial conditions uh, whatsoever. Well, you don't, you have, once you fix initial conditions, the, the results will be always the same. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so once again, I, I want to repeat that we observe here that for the ground state, as we, as we squeeze our trap, we observe the possibility of adiabatically pumping our system from the S wave relative motion, meaning that this expectation value is equal to zero, to the D wave relative motion, meaning that this expectation value is equal to two. What does it mean? It means that initially we have no rotation of the relative motion in our system. But as we squeeze our, our trap, then these two atoms, they start rotating. However, we have spherical symmetry, so this rotation is around any axis in, around any, axis in any possible direction. And to see this rotation, you, you can only do that by turning off your trap and looking at the azimuthal, uh, azimuthal part of your velocity. So this would be an experiment to really trace this rotation in your system. Because when, yeah. So uh, this is like infinitely slowly squeezing. So this is an adiabatic process. Ah, yeah, yeah, distance between, exactly. But I, I, I don't remember the exact numbers. Yeah, but this is a good scale. Yeah, so. And this, this effect really reminds the classical einstein de Haas effect. I just want to remind you this effect, maybe you are not familiar with, with it. So imagine this is a very uh, simple scheme. So we have a ferrom ferromagnetic probe, which is attached to some string and suspended in the air. We put our probe in an external magnetic field. And then we abruptly, abruptly change the direction of the magnetic field, and the ferromagnetic probe starts rotating. And this is one more time the effect of uh, angular moment, total angular momentum conservation, 
and also this coupling between the external orbital momentum of our system and internal states of our atoms, internal spin states of our atoms. So here, in fact, we have an analog of that, but only for two quantum mechanical analog and only for two atoms, but very similar in fact. Okay, so this is something I wanted to tell about anisotropy. Then uh, let me proceed with uh, local versus non-local battles in the dipolar systems, and for that I'm going to consider n bosons moving in a ring trap. So imagine we have exactly n bosons, and in such system we can observe that once again we have rotational symmetry. This once again gives us total angular momentum conservation. Total angular momentum here is denoted as a uh, capital K. And this is a nice system, not, not, uh, not only because we have the conservation, uh, uh, conservation of the total angular momentum, but also because for the situation when we have only contact interactions in our system, both uh, attractive or repulsive, we have exactly solvable model, the Lieb-Leninger model, for which all possible things were calculated in, uh, in the early 60s. And I want to present you this solution because it is quite important for the uh, next part of my talk. So here I present the uh, solutions for the rep repulsive interaction. So we have repulsive contact interaction. And we see the spectrum as a function of the total angular momentum divided by number of particles. And what Liebt and Leninger they observed was the following. That all possible quantum states in, in this system can be constructed only by using states from two elementary branches, uh, two branches of elementary excitations. And they divided their excitations into type 1 excitation and type 2 excitation. Type 1 excitation, they were immediately uh, uh, identified as a Bogolyubov excitations, so quasi-particle excitations. But type 2 excitations, they were then studied as a collective excitations in our system. We also see that the type 2 excitations are, the l the, they are excitations with the lowest energy for a given total angular momentum in our system. Par a particularly beautiful interpretation of these two, um, these two branches of elementary exci uh, excitations can be found uh, in the limit of non-interacting gas. So for non-interacting gas moving on a ring, it is a very easy and all, all of us can solve it on the piece of paper. But the important thing is that type that in particular we can see that there are two elementary ways of exciting our system, on, of imparting to our system a total momentum capital K. The first one is just simply taking one particle and then kicking it with whole capital K angular momentum. And the dispersion relation in this case is quadratic, as we know from high school, for free particle. So once again, this is a single particle excitation branch. However, we can, we can proceed in a more optimal way and we can take exactly capital K atoms and then excite them only by a single quanta of angular momentum, and then our dispersion relation is linear in energy. So this is a collective branch. So type 1 excitation, these are single particle excitations. Type 2 excitations, there are collective excitation. And it also holds for, um, for interacting system, but it is, it is harder to show on your fingers that this is the case. Okay, so I want to study further Bogolyubov spectrum, so this type 1 excitation in the Lip Leninger model. And this excitation spectrum is given by a very simple formula where this V tod is, uh, in, uh, this is uh, effective interaction potential in the momentum space. And in fact, we have three possible scenarios. Uh, for the Bogolyubov spectrum. First of all, we can have ideal gas. As I told you before, it is just parabolic spectrum, free particle spectrum. Then we can have contact interaction for which v of k is a constant. 
where g is the strength of contact interactions. And for that, for small k, we have a linear dependency and then parabolic dependency of free particles. However, for dipolar gases in 1D and 2D, it is possible to show that our Bogolyubov spectrum, excitation spectrum, may look may develop a local minimum for a finite uh, value of momentum, which is called the roton. And it is, it is related to the theory of superfluid helium, but uh, I, am not, uh, I am not going to talk about uh, that. But the following question was, we were interested in this ring geometry and we wanted to have dipoles instead of just contact interacting particles. We knew that for the lip linear we have two types of excitations. Then Bogolyubov, is given, uh, Bogolyubov uh, spectrum is given by a linear part and then quadratic one. Our question was, so if it is possible for dipolar interactions to develop the rotten minimum in the Bogolyubov spectrum, maybe it is possible to to change, to swap these two types of excitations and having the, the rotten excitation as the lowest uh, eigenstates for a given total momentum, which is also called the era state. Also, as we were able to study this from a few body, many body perspective, we also ha had an access to many body wave function of the rotten, so we were also interested in answering the question how the many body wave function of rotten looks like. And for that, let me introduce a very simple model. So we have dipoles moving on a ring, and they are polarized in a way that they are in side-by-side -side configuration, so they repel each other. Also, in fact, when we deal with dipolar interactions, we have to take into account not a really 1D scenario, but a rather quasi 1D scenario. So we have uh, two transverse dimensions in which the motion is highly constrained, but we introduce uh, some squeezing parameter, which is some aspect ratio parameter, which, which tells us how, how squeezed uh, are these transverse degrees of freedom. And then we can study the uh, excitation spectrum of our system using the exact diagonalization. So we have the Hamiltonian and we are looking for eigenstates of our system. And initially, we can assume that we do not have any short range interaction because, as I told you before, in ultra cold gases, we can turn, in, turn on and turn off our short range interactions and so on. So, yeah, our potential in this case for, 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 uh, for our atoms, our dipolar potential, it is quasi 1D and it looks something like that in the momentum space, what is important is that our total potential uh, have this dependency which allows in, in general to develop the rotten minimum. So we calculated the spectrum as a function of the total momentum in our system. So these squares and circles, these are obtained by our exact diagonalization scheme. scheme and these are the lowest eigenstates for a given total momentum value, and we compare them with Bogolyubov approximation. And as we can see, at some point, we, we see the departure between the rotten excitation, uh, b between, the, uh, between the exact solution and the Bogolyubov uh, calculations. However, if we introduce to our system a short-range attraction and also change the aspect ratio in our system, it is possible to gradually change the shape of our spectrum. Namely, we can, we can show that for some values of parameters, short-range parameters and the aspect ratio, we can have the era spectrum which have this rotten minimum. So we can observe, observe the change of the state. And right now we also see that our Bogolyubov spectrum follows the exact solutions. So we wanted to study this change between this uh, black point and red point uh, in, in, in a more detailed way. And first of all, we calculated the single particle momentum distribution for our state, uh, for our black dot state and red dot state. And here we can look at the, this blue line 
For the black, black point state, we see that there is no local maxima in our single particle momentum distribution. This means that our excitation, this excitation is collective. However, if we calculate this for rotonic states, so for the red point here, we see that it develops the uh, local maximum in the single particle momentum distribution, meaning that really this excitation right now uh, became something more like single particle excitation. So the character of the lowest branch of our excitations was changed. Also, when we want to characterize this state further, we can observe that in a single shot measurement, the rotten appear as a spatially localized excitation, meaning that our atoms will be divided into several groups and the number of these groups is related to the rotten uh, momentum. So in a single shot, we, we see something like crystal, something of special ordering. And it can be shown also that when someone manipulates with the parameters further and obtain the situation that our rotten minimum touches the ground state energy, that the rotten becomes uh, the ground state, the metastable state, it is in fact the super solid because we have crystalline ordering and also some flow in our system, which is in fact the super fluid flow in this case. Okay, so different scenario to consider is that we have different pol polarization of our dipolar atoms and we put them into the head to tail configuration where the dipolar interactions are purely attractive and we introduce some repulsion on the short ranges. So we change basically in, in this problem, we change the polarization of our dipoles from side to uh, by side to head to tail. So is this, uh, is there any chance we have so polarization? Around polarization? Yeah, you can really polarize them in a, at any angle you, wi you wish. Uh, these are extreme. Field. Yeah, yeah, using magnetic field. So here we have some. Yeah, so in this case, our dipolar uh, interaction in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in space looks something like that. Once again, we have this 1 over x cube dependence for long distances, which is something uh, natural for dipolar interactions. And also for short range, we have a finite value for zero because of the fact that it is a quasi 1D uh, situation. So we also can control the global character of our interactions. So let me introduce this parameter ifdd, which, is, which gives only the information uh, of the dipolar interaction attraction strength over short range repulsion. So where when fdd is larger than... Sweet, I have a question about the definition of this dipolar process here in this configuration. Yeah. This is one dimensional system with periodic boundary okay, conditions. So draw the circle, just say that yeah, but we also okay. checked that we also checked that there are small differences when you are. Okay, but we should stress that you yeah. solve, solve the system which is on the circle. Yeah. Okay. okay. I agree with that. But uh, yeah, we are going to tell we are going to tell about the bound states, and in fact, it will it it will it won't matter at all. <laughs> okay, so we can control global character of our interactions. Uh, so if our parameter FDD is smaller than one, it means that we have net repulsion in our system. That the short range repulsion is stronger than the long range attraction. If FDD is uh, larger than one, it is the other way around. So we can control the net character of our interactions. Uh, we can, people, people also sh uh, showed that in the case where we have attraction being dominant in our system, in fact, it is easy to imagine that, we, that the bound state is possible in our system. And such bound states were studied by many people and they are, by many people and they are just uh, bright solitons. 
but we are interested in different question. So imagine that we have a uh, net repulsion in our system. And the simple question is, is it possible to have a bound state for a repulsion, for a net repulsion? Because we have different scales of our interactions. So we have short range repulsion, but long range attraction. Is it possible to have a bound state? So imagine that our, we, we can control the strength of our overall interaction in the system. So the potential of uh, interaction potential between two atoms, it is given by this repulsion, attraction, but also we, we have some dimensional parameter gamma, which we use to, to control the strength of interaction. And then one can show by exact diagonalization in our system, by finding the ground scene of our system, that for some values of lambda, indeed, we we obtain the bound state with the negative energy. Also, this will agree with the second order perturbation theory. So for such potential in the second order perturbation theory, you can show that uh, a bound state for the net repulsion in your system is possible. Okay, so we, no we right now know that it is possible, but we wanted to study its properties. So because of our technique, we have an access to the many-body wave function. And when we have the many-body wave function, we know that the square modulus of our many-body wave function give us the multivariate probability distribution. And out of this multivariate probability, distribu probability distribution, we can draw the most possible configurations in our system. The most probable, yeah, the most probable configurations in our system. And it turned out that when we do such procedure, procedure we, we really s observe the density distribution, which is a density distribution of a bound state. And here, there's a density distribution for three, four, and five particles only. But we can see uh, that as we increase the number of particles, also this density widens which is in the opposition to the bright soliton, so for the uh, net attraction in our system, when we, when we add the uh, additional particles, our density shrinks. Uh, we also wanted to study general properties of, of, this, uh, of this state, and we uh, focused on the second order correlation function because, as we know, uh, the expectation value of Hamiltonian, so the average energy on a single quantum state, it is just can be uh, expressed in the following way. Here we have the average kinetic energy, and here the average potential energy is connected to the second order correlation function. So, in fact, the information that really it is possible to have the bound state for a net repulsion in our system should be somehow encoded in this G2 correlation function. And it is plotted here. And as we can see, for this bound state, we, we observe an anti-bunching for small distances between two particles, and then some enhanced maximum in the second order correlation function. But as we see, this anti-bunching range is much, uh, is much lower than the characteristic length of dipolar interactions given by this sigma parameter. So with that information in mind, we wanted to somehow extend our analysis on larger systems because we were not able to uh, calculate uh, to calculate the many-body wave function for lar larger systems using exact diagonalization. It was too complicated. But once again, so we observed that the typical range of anti-correlation in our bound state is much lower than the range of dipolar interactions. Then we assumed that on this short, short scale, our atoms in fact obey the 1D model for contact interactions, the lieb linear model. Because on this scale, the dipolar interactions, they do not change significantly, so they are almost constant. With this assumption, 
we in fact uh, did the local density approximation for which the dipolar interactions are treated as a trapping potential. So once again, we have some local behavior given by this leap linear model I mentioned earlier. And dipolar interactions that are like a, just a trapping potential. And having this in mind, this means that our state should have the following inequality fulfilled, namely that n times the sigma, so this characteristic length of dipolar interactions, should be much larger than the, uh, than, uh, than the size of our bound state. And with that, we came up with the functional, uh, with the energy functional as a, as a functional of density, when we have this local term given by the leap linear solution and also this, this trapping potential given by the dipole dipole interaction. Also, here is some kinetic uh, energy uh, of the en envelope added to this density uh, functional. And then, with that, we can really study much larger systems. And once again, we can study using variational uh, calculation out of this uh, density functional, we can study density of our system as a function of increasing number of atoms. As, as we can see, at some point, the, the ground state, this bound state, grow, uh, uh, is getting larger and larger, but at some point, it only, it, it's only getting wider. So the peak density of the system is the same, but it is getting wider. And it is a hallmark of the droplet solution. So here, in fact, we also have the negative but constant chemical potential, and it is exactly this flat top distribution of the density. So in fact, what we found, and this bound state is, in fact, is a quantum droplet. Finally, this was some effective uh, picture to, to describe larger uh, larger systems out of some configura configurations on small system, but we wanted to return to some many body uh, considerations once again, and we studied the limit of infinite repulsion in our system, but a finite value of the dipolar interactions. And we were also able to prove that even for that case, it is possible to form a bound state, even for a infinite repulsion in the system. And to study it from the many-body wave function, we propose the following ansatz. So we, we assume that we have a bound state, which is a hard wall box of within V, which is a variational parameter. And then we assume that inside our particles, there are like ideal gas, but, but of fermions. So we dealt here with bosons, but in this ansatz for the in finite repulsion, we assume that we have hard wall box, but with fermions inside, uh, but with ideal fermions inside. And for hard wall box, we have, you know, the, the, all the eigenstates for non-interacting case, these, these are very easy. But why this assumption is valid? Because we dealt with uh, bosons, and right now I am talking about some wave function for fermions. When we have the limit of the, sh uh, of the in finite repulsion, it was shown by Tongs and Girardot in, uh, many years ago that, in fact, we have mapping. So, rep so infinitely repulsive bosons, they map on the ideal fermions. It is called fermionization, and it means that even for bosonic uh, case, only one particle can, be in a, can occupy a given quantum single particle state. So in this ansatz, the only variational parameter is D, so this with of our, of our of our solution. And we, once again, using variational calculation, we compare this with this effective description I mentioned earlier. And as we study the V, so the uh, with it of the bound state, of the droplet state, and compare our ansatz with with the solution of this effective approach I, uh, I, I, I um, showed you before, and as we can see, it agrees uh, pretty well. So here, what we found in this work 
it was that it is possible to have a bounce rate for, rep for overall repulsion in our system. We proposed an effective description for uh, any value of this FDD, so this control parameter of the net character of interactions in our system. But then, for the limit of the inf infinite repulsion, we come back to the many-body ansatz and also find a nice interpretation of such droplets for uh, infinite repulsion. Uh, uh, once again, can you? The sigma is only, uh, sorry, so, uh, so sigma gives you only this range of dipolar interactions. No, no, this sigma is all, all the same. Yeah, it is, yeah, so it, so this, uh, our effective description depends on sigma. Yes, here. Yeah, this is inequality for our effective uh, approach to be valid. Yes, and this sigma means really this range of dipolar interactions. Sigma, uh, sigma is not a free parameter. Yeah, so with all of that, I want to end, and I'm uh, looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much. Questions? I have only a small, co small comment about this fermionization um, because in this TG limit, this limit of infinite repulsions yeah. for bosons, it is not uh, really true that uh, the wave function of bosons is, uh, is the same as wave function of fermions. Of course, uh, but it's a uh, modulus, me, yes. No, 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 there is only mapping. So if you have one wave, wave function, you can comp uh, uh, create the next one. And therefore, this conclusion you wrote here, only one particle in a given state, is not fully true. Because if you calculate the expectation value, uh, uh, the probability that you can find two or more particles on a given state, it will be non-zero in this, in this limit, even. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, 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 single yeah, yeah. Okay. particle density in the position representation only is exactly Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is all, only my clarification. I, yeah, I yeah, yeah, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> I agree with that. Even if you calculate the momentum distribution, single particle yeah, density. Yeah, it has to be, it has to be different, yeah. Yes, yes. Still we have bosons instead of fermions, it is just mapping. Okay, any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, let's... Uh, ah. And, and, and I think rather important. Uh, Rafał at the very beginning mentioned that I was his supervisor and that Krzysztof played such an important role. I think we should also mention. Ah, yeah, yeah, Lecki, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Who was really a co worker and yeah, a very active one on most As you of probably this saw in all of this work I presented here, it was also with Wojtek, which is pr uh, who is present here, and I also want to thank him. So, yeah, he was very involved. So. Let's thank the speaker.